Sati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, and we're studying Lord Kapila's teachings, and today we're on chapter number 32. And this is at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav, right? So I'll, oh wait. I have to first of all open the, uh, share the screen. Mm. Okay, Kapila Shiksha, Chapter 32. We'll begin with Srila Sanatan Goswami's glorification of Srimad Bhagavatam. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar churned from the ocean of all scriptures, you are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas, enriched with the jewel of all conclusive truth. You grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has risen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna who has returned among us. O Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss, because your syllable shower pure love of God upon the reader. You are always to be served by everyone, for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O oh, my companion, O oh, my teacher, O oh, my great wealth, O oh, my deliverer, O oh, my good fortune, O oh, my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O oh, Srimad Bhagavatam, O oh, bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O oh, uplifter of the most fallen, please don't ever leave me, accompanied by pure love of Krishna. Please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. Okay, so here's Kapila Shiksha. Devahuti is questioning in the beginning, chapter 25, her questions. Dispel my illusion, what kind of bhakti should I perform, what's the process of jnana and yoga, how many limbs are there? Chapter 26, the path of Gyan, and 27 and 28, the method of liberation. And we heard also the different limbs of the Astanga Yoga and descriptions of the Lord for meditating on Him. 29, told, tell me about the path of Bhakti, various classes of Bhakti, Bhakti influence bhakti performed by people in the modes of passion and ignorance and goodness. Still it's not pure bhakti. What is pure bhakti? So that was all explained in chapter 29. 
So, to understand the connection with chapter 32, we're going to hear back in chapter 29, Devahuti's question. Devahuti continued, My dear Lord, please also describe in detail, both for me and for people in general, the continual process of birth and death. For by hearing of such calamities, we may become detached from the activities of this material world. Please also describe eternal time, which is a representation of your form, and by whose influence people in general engage in the performance of pious activities. So that was back in chapter 29, verses 3 and 4. Devahuti wanted to know about the influence of time and how people perform these pi pious activities influenced by them. We're going to hear about that today. So chapter 30, when we read chapter 30, we heard about the lower modes of nature, tamagun, the mode of ignorance and the symptoms of the mode of ignorance, uncontrolled senses, lust, anger, greed and violence. Not very pleasant things. We heard about how the, the living entity works very hard to make money, trying to satisfy, then he goes to hell and he suffers in hell, he's taken to Yamaraj, suffers is punished, com comes back to the human form, right? There's, here you can see some kinds of hellish punishment which the living entity has to go through as a result of their sinful activities. How they eat, they've eaten animals, they've cooked animals, so they're cooked alive. Their subtle bodies are punished. These descriptions are all there in Srimad Bhagavatam in the fifth canto, descriptions of different kinds of hell. Born as an animal, born, no. born as animals and later as human beings due to the law of karma. So, our activities in this life will determine our future life, just as the body which we have now is the result of actions we performed in the past. So this is the law of karma. We're preparing our bodies by our activity. And this earth planet this earth planet, this is karmastan, this is the place where we earn the karma, which causes our suffering and happiness also. So chapter 31, yesterday we heard about the movements of the living entities, how after being punished in hell and coming through animal bodies, eventually got a human body again. And then we heard about the child in the womb, how much suffering is there, how uncomfortable, how miserable the situation is within the womb. And some children, not all children, but some children become conscious and pray by the time they get to seven months in the womb, they begin to pray to the Lord. They pray to the Lord. Initially their prayers are, you can see here, the soul suffers in the mother's womb. We heard about that. And then he offers prayers. Initially he's praying, let me out, let me out, that I will certainly worship you if you let me out. If you take me out of this, I will certainly worship you. But then it, it, when it comes time for the child to come out, then the child changes his mind and thinks, I think I better stay here. It's better for me to stay in the womb rather than to come out. Because when I come out of the womb, then I'll become enamored. I, I will forget 
what I promised when I was in the womb. Just like when we become devotees, in the beginning when we get initiation we promise to do things, but then later on somehow we just forget, it's all forgotten. Forgetfulness is part of our conditioned life. So forgetfulness after birth, after the, the seminal birth, sometimes also after the spiritual birth, there's also forgetfulness. We get the initiation and we promise, chant 16 rounds, but then after initiation somehow, oh I forgot, oh I've been so busy, like that. So forgetfulness after birth, both material birth and spiritual birth, we can forget. And then we spoke, we had a nice discussion about association and how we have to be aware of bad association. Bad association is there for men and for women. We have to be able to discriminate, to find good association and to be very careful not to be influenced by the material energy. Bad association. Particularly the bad association can be with the opposite sex. So we have to be very careful how we associate. And then the final section yesterday was about reclaiming one's eternal nature. That by remembering Radha and Krishna and meditate, remembering the, the form of the Lord, chanting His name, engaging in His service, we can re-establish our spiritual position and get free from the material energy. So that was yesterday's class. So we're going on today to hear about something about the mode of goodness, but not pure goodness. It's going to be mixed with passion. So mixed passion and goodness. We heard yesterday it was passion and ignorance, and today is mixed passion and goodness. So chapter is entitled, Entanglement in Fruitive Activities. Fruitive activities can be, according to scriptures, or they can simply be just simply for our own sense gratification. So look, let's look at the connection to the previous chapter. We have a comment here from Aracharya Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Having explained the results of condemned sinful activities in chapter 30 and 31, now Kapila explains the results of prescribed activities with material desire. Living in his house, he enjoys the results of the various dharmas, karma, artha, and dharma. It should be dharma, kama, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, right? Uh, moksha, kama, artha, <laughs> dharma. Somehow we got confused there. And again, he performs those dharmas. He enjoys the results of the various dharmas. So they're all dharmas, kama, artha, and dhamma. Practically nobody's thinking about moksha. We're hearing about fruitive activities in this chapter. So there's no mention of moksha. We're just hearing about people interested in enjoying the results. People interested in moksha, very rare, very rare someone wants moksha. People are more fruitive, they want to enjoy the results, they want this karma and artha, and they'll do dharma to get it. So this is going to be explained in this chapter. Bharijan Prabhu, who has written his uh, commentary, if you like, on uh, this section in the Bhagavatam, he has the book Unveiling His Lotus Feet. So he says, 
Although in chapter 31, Kapila Muni implanted fear in the heart of his followers by describing the horrific results brought about by the attempt to enjoy contrary to Shastric regulations. One may nevertheless wonder if one can be happy and avoid suffering and rebirth through pious non-devotional following of Shastra. By delineating the results obtained by the followers of various paths of karma, Kapila Muni will answer that question. All right, so understand what is going to be explained. Pious, non-devotional following of Shastra. No, people follow, can follow Shastra without devotion. They're pious. They don't have any devotion. They just want to enjoy the result. It's karma kandi activities. Right? Karma kandi, you want to enjoy. So Kapila Muni is going to describe the results of people who follow different paths of karma. It's not just one path, there's different paths. Some, there's Sakama Karma Moksha and Niskam Karma Moksha. Some are very attached and some are not so attached, some are detached. And different levels of Karma Kanda, different paths of karma. So it will be described. So this chapter is a little complex, there's several levels. So it begins with Sakama, the Sakama Karmi, the one who is attached. He really wants to enjoy the results. So he reaches, he can go up to the heavenly planets, but he will fall down when his pious activities are finished. He can go up for some time, but he cannot stay there. So that's the nature of Karma Kandi activities. You can go up to heavenly planets, but how long you'll stay there will be according to how much punya, how much pious activities you've actually done. And then, after describing the Sakam Karmi, then Lord Kapila describes the Niskam Karmi. Niskam Karmi means the one who's not attached to the result. It, he works. He likes the work, he's attached to the work, but he's not much concerned with the results. He will give the results away. He doesn't want the results himself. So this person will advance gradually towards the spiritual sky. He won't immediately go back to Godhead, but he can go up, he may go up to Brahma Loka, he may stay there at Brahma Loka, and at the end of the life of Brahma, then at that time, then he may go back to the spiritual sky. Of course, you have to be very careful if you do that, because when you go up, when you go up to the higher planets, then there's more opportunity for sense gratification. So you really have to be detached to do this kind of yoga, niskam karma yogi. And this Niskam Karmi is very close to Bhakti, very close. He's not attached to the result and he can become a devotee easily with the right association. So the next section, texts 8 to 11, we'll hear about worshippers of the Haranyagarbha. Haranyagarbha meaning Garbo Dhaka Shai Vishnu. These people will reach Satyalok, Satyalok, the planet of Lord Brahma. Later, they may achieve liberation with Brahma at the end of his life. So like that, like the Nishkam Karmi, they may be elevated. These people who worship the Haranyagarbha, they can go up to Brahma Loka. They may get liberation at the end of Brahma's life. Then text 12 to 15. Lord Kapila is explaining the importance of bhakti, that if we don't have any devotion, 
then there's no way we can enter into the spiritual world. You must have devotion. Krishna, of course, has said this in Bhagavad Gita, and the same thing is said here in this Kapila Shiksha, the importance of bhakti, crucial to get into the spiritual world. Then text 16 to 21, the Sakama Karmi is condemned. So in the very beginning we heard about the Sakama Karmi, so this talked about again. If somebody really attached to the results and they're attached to the work, they do some, they follow some injunctions of the scriptures, but they don't give any portion of their results. They just want to enjoy the results themselves. Then this is condemned by Lord Kapila. They're very attached, strongly attached. Although they follow scripture, but still their purpose is to, to enjoy materially. Then verses 22 to 26, we're going to hear some conclusion, conclusion of the teachings of Lord Kapila, because this, this will be the final chapter where Lord Kapila is teaching. The next chapter tomorrow, Lord Kapila is not going to teach, it's all, it's all given in this chapter. Tomorrow we'll just hear about Devahuti and how she applies the teaching. So the conclusion, bhakti is the best process. Then 27 to 38, reviewing what, we was, what was taught earlier in the teachings. Astanga yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, time and birth and death. All of these things have been dealt with in some depth in the various chapters, right, from 25 up to 32. These are the different topics which have been covered. Bhakti, then Gyan, then Astanga, and then later we heard about time and birth and death, so Kala and Samsa. Then 39 to 42, who should be instructed in Sankhya Yoga? Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also said, who's qualified to hear the Bhagavad Gita? Don't let this person, don't let the envious hear it. Don't let people who have no devotion hear it. So in the same way, there's a section here about who is actually worthy to receive this knowledge of Sankhya Yoga. And then final verse, 43, we'll hear the Falakshruti, the fruit of these teachings. What benefit are we going to get from these teachings? So that's the final verse of the chapter. And it's the end of the Kapila Shiksha, but still there's one chapter tomorrow, 33, to hear about Devahuti, what's she going to do. Okay, so we'll begin, go through the chapter. We hear first of all, Text number one, remember, the sa kama karmi, the material, the, the person who's pious a, a little bit, he's pious to some extent because he follows scripture, but he's very attached. He's very attached, he wants to enjoy, but he does do some scriptural duties. So the first verse describes, the personality of Godhead said, the person who lives in the center of householder life derives material benefits by performing religious rituals, and thereby he fulfills his desire for economic development and sense gratification. Again and again he acts the same way. Right? So. We have to read the other verses. We'll know more about the Sakama Karmi. If you read up the text four, you can understand what are the what is the mood of the Sakama Karmi. But it's pretty much described here in this very first verse. Pious because 
He does religious rituals. He does do some religious rituals. He does his puja. He does something. But his consciousness, he, householder life. He wants material facilities. He wants economic development. He wants sense gratification. And this is the purpose of him being pious. This is the purpose of him doing all of these different rituals. There's no question of thinking of trying to please the Supreme Lord. For the Sakama Karmi, he just want, he's thinking only about himself. So, we put chewing the chewed, chewing the chewed. Prahlad Maharaj said, puna puna, puna puna charvita charvananam. Chewing what has already been chewed. The materialist, the Sakama Karmi, he wants to enjoy, but it's already been enjoyed before. They've already enjoyed. So many others have enjoyed whatever enjoyment was there. It's all gone. There's no real pleasure there, but it's the illusion of pleasure. Okay, so going ahead, the summary of the Nishkam Karma Yogi. Verses 5 to 7. The Nishkam Karma Yogi, he's not attached, and, but he's dutiful, he performs his work. He's following scriptures, and, but he's giving the results of his work. He's giving it for, to others. He's not attached. He's attached to the work but not to the results. So it's explained, superior to the Grihamedis are those who perform their work with detachment, dutifully, in purified consciousness, free from a sense of proprietorship and not swayed by sensual desires. So very fully described there, the nature of this uh, yogi. He, he will do the rituals, but he's not trying to enjoy the results. He doesn't consider himself to be the proprietor. He's not carrying a lot of material desires in his heart. So it's explained, that detached workers can be divided into two groups. We have the Niskam Karma Yogis and we have also the Bhaktas. So those who are devotees, those who are doing devotional service, they are also, they should also be detached workers. You know when you studied the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhakti Yoga is at the top of the yoga ladder. So bhakti yoga includes all the other yogas. So a bhakti yogi is also a karma yogi. So karma yoga means do, do one's duty in a detached manner. So the devotee also is a detached worker. Bhakta doesn't mean idle, do nothing. He must work and he works without attachment. So two, ta two kinds of detached worker. One is the devotee and one is the Niskam Karma Yogi. Niskam Karma Yogi, he may become a devotee, he can easily become a devotee, but he may never heard about the path of devotion. So, it's up to devotees to preach and make these people devotees. By Niskam Karma Yoga, one gradually approaches the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the path of illumination through the Sun planet. And so you can see this is, a, this is a very indirect approach to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They're going through the path of illumination through the Sun planet. So that takes a lot of time, a lot of trouble. But that's Niskam Karma Yoga. It's like that. For the bhakta, for the devotee, they can go directly 
to the Supreme Personality. They don't need to go through the Sun Planet. This is the indirect path. Devotees, however, are quickly taken back to Godhead by the Lord Himself. Krishna Himself or Lord Vishnu Himself comes and arranges for the devotee to go back to Godhead. We don't have to do it. They, he will arrange it. Dhruva, when Dhruva Maharaj was going, the Lord sent the Vaikuntha airplanes to bring him. So like that, Ajamil also, the Vishnu Dudas came to take him. Okay, going ahead, next section, perfect yogis and worshippers of the Haranyagarbha, described in verses 8 to 10. Worshippers of the Haranyagarbha, Garbhu Dakashai Vishnu, do not approach the Lord directly in Vaikuntha. They remain in Brahmaloka until the final dissolution of the universe and then may be transferred with Brahma to the spiritual sky. Okay, so you can see, they're, if they're going to go to the spiritual world, they have to wait. They have to wait quite a while. They have to wait for the end of the life of Brahma. At the end of Lord Brahma's life, then Lord Brahma, him, the, you know, everything will be annihilated, there will be total annihilation. We'll all enter back into the body of Mahavishnu. So at that time, if Lord Brahma is a pure devotee, then he will go to the spiritual world. And those who are worshippers of the Haranyagarbha, they may also go with Brahma. They, they will usually go there to Brahma Loka and they'll wait there on Brahma Loka until the end of the life of Brahma. And at that time then they'll follow Brahma into the spiritual sky. So that can mean a long wait. Even though Brahma lives for 100 years, and 100 years, one year, one day of Brahma is so many years on this planet. So it's, the life of Brahma is inconceivable, so long. Perfect yogis also attain Brahma Loka and are unable to directly enter Vaikuntha or merge in the Brahma Jyoti. They may go to Brahma Loka, but they cannot just go straight into Vaikuntha. They cannot even merge in the Brahma Jyoti. So these yogis, they have to wait there in Brahma Loka, which is still within the material world. Although Brahma Loka is one of the supreme planet, but they, the yogis, they, have, they wait there for the end of the universe, the end of the life of Brahma. Since they remain in the material atmosphere, all these exalted souls risk taking birth again. You see, this is the problem. They're, they're still in the material world. So you may take, you end up taking another body. So it's difficult unless one is really fixed in Krishna consciousness, unless one has really absorbed his mind. They may be perfect yogis, they've controlled their mind and senses, but they haven't got devotion. So their position is not really secure. At any time they may fall down. So this is the problem, that's what's mentioned here. That even you go all the way up to Brahma Loka, you're not safe. You can fall down again. So Kapila Muni has been describing these different people. We heard about the Sakama Karmi, the Niskam Karma Karmi. Niskam Karma Yogi and then the worshippers of the Haranyagarbha. 
So, after describing the followers of different spiritual paths and the result they achieve, Lord Kapila advises his mother. Lord Kap his mother, Devahuti, had come that she wants to get guidance from her son. Lord Brahma had told her, you're going to have a son who is the Supreme Lord, so you should take, you should, you're so fortunate, You'll be, he'll be able to instruct you. So here's one of the instructions of Lord Kapila given to his mother. Therefore, my dear mother, by devotional service, take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is seated in everyone's heart. Right? Lord Kapila is telling his mother, you have to just take shelter of the Supreme Lord. He is in your heart, he is in everyone's heart. So just take shelter of him by devotional service. So we see the message of Kapila Shiksha is not different from the teachings of Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna or the, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. They're all preaching the importance of devotional service. And by devotional service, we take shelter of the Supreme Lord. Devotional service, meaning beginning with hearing, chanting, then remembering. So this is the purpose of Bhakti Yoga. Srila Prabhupada explains from the purport of this verse, text number 11. Lord Kapila advised his mother that she did not need any indirect process. You know, sometimes as devotees we think also, we think, oh, bhakti, you know, yeah, bhakti is okay, but let me do these other things as well. And we do other things like we'll do some pranayama, Maybe we'll do some asanas, we'll do some speculation, we'll do some jnana yogi, whatever, whatever we can think of, whatever's fashionable, we want to try it. And we think this will help my bhakti. But Lord Kapila told his mother she didn't need any indirect process. She was already situated in that direct process because the Supreme Lord had taken birth as her son. So because the Lord had appeared in the womb of Devahuti, it's an indication that she's very fortunate, she's a very pure soul. So she doesn't need to do anything else. Actually, she did not need any further instruction because she was already in the perfectional state. Somebody is perfect, no, you don't need to tell them what to do. They know what to do. They know everything. We often hear, we often hear from people, I know this, I know this, I know it all. I've read Bhagavad Gita. But Devahuti, she actually had realized it. Not only did, had, does she know it, but it, we can see it being applied in her life that the Supreme Lord has come as her son just to allow her to perfect her devotion. So this is a, the power of pure bhakti. The, the pure devotees, they enjoy these loving relationships with the Lord. Sometimes as a son, sometimes as a, a friend, sometimes as a lover, oh, maybe just a servant. Of course, we are all servants. So Devahuti is also a servant. Okay, so Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Sanatana Goswami's famous book, describes, as we can see the heading, not all the paths lead to the same goal. And so in this section, in that section, which we've mentioned, of the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, uh, it's described, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, the second part, so it describes about the travels of Gop Kumar and how he went to different places and he met with many different people. And so different places, there's some places you will enjoy the three worlds, Bu, Buvar and Swar. 
right? You can enjoy those three worlds in the material world. And then above the three worlds, then you have the four planetary systems, very high within the universe. You have uh, Janaloka, Mahaloka, Tapaloka, and Satyaloka, right? These different planets, different levels are there, all within the material world. Just like we're hearing about Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma's planet is called Satyaloka. And so that's the highest planet, but it's within the material world. We know there's also birth and there's death there also. Brahma also has to worry about dying. We're not the only ones who are worrying about dying. Lord Brahma also is thinking about that. And he's already just over 50 years old, according to the time of Brahma. So, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita describes, even in the spiritual world, there are different levels of pure devotees. There are different uh, levels of prema bhakti. We find people, there are some people who achieve perfection by doing sadhana. And the example given in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, they say, the son of Rishavdev, Bharat Maharaj that he became perfect by just simply by doing good sadhana. Raghunath Das Goswami also did very good sadhana. Of course, he, he also had prem, but he was also doing very good sadhana. It said Raghunath Das Goswami, that the regulative principles for him, they were like lines on a stone. You know, if there's a line on the stone, you cannot rub it off, you cannot get rid of it. They're going to stay there. So he followed, Raghunath followed regulative principles, just like there were lines on the stone. There's no question of not following, no question of deviation. So Bharat Maharaj was an example of a sudden bhakti. And then above sadhana bhakti, you've got shuddha bhaktas. And should, the example of shuddha bhakta given in the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita is Ambarish Maharaj. Ambarish Maharaj, he's a shuddha bhakta. He's a pure devotee. He's doing pure devotion. Ambarish Maharaj, of course, he was a great king in Mathura. And he, he was always using his different sensual organs for the service of Krishna. It's described, Savaimana Krishna Pararavinda yo Vachamsi Vaikuntha Gunarna Varnane Karo Harer Mandira Marjanadi Shu Shrutim Chakra Chuta Satkatodaye. Right? Srimad Bhagavatam describes the activities of Ambarish Maharaj like that. How in the beginning, he fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Krishna and then uh, he used his ears to hear the glories of the Lord and he used his hands to clean the temple and he, he, he used his tongue to chant the glories of the Lord in his different pastimes, different activities. So he's, he's a Shuddha Bhakta. He's a great devotee, and that's how even Durvasa Muni had to come and offer obeisances to Ambarish Maharaj and beg forgiveness. But above Shuddha Bhaktas, you've got Prema Bhaktas. Uh, you've got people who have love of God. They're, 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 uh, Bharat Maharaj and Ambarish Maharaj, they're not yet Prema Bhaktas. But the example of the Prema Bhakta is Hanuman. Hanuman, that he has so much love for the Lord. He's all, and his, his mood is to be the servant. He's always waiting, kneeling, waiting for service. And as soon as there's some service, Hanuman's off. He's very eager to do service. So he's an example of a Prima Bhakta. And then you've got Prima Para Bhaktas. The Pandavas, particularly Arjun, they're prema para bhaktas. They have intense love for the Lord. That their bhakti, their prema is so like an ocean, so much. 
But then above that, then you've got more devotees. You've got the the Premadiya Bhaktas. Prema Premadiya Bhaktas. How do I can't remember what is it? Called? They're called uh, oh Prematara. Prematara Bhaktas. And the example the Prematara Bhaktas are Uddhava and the Yadavas, the Yadu dynasty, they all have very deep, very thick, very concentrated love for the Lord. So this is all described in Brihad Bhagavatamrita and the point Sanatana Goswami is explaining different levels of devotees. Not all on the same path, on the same goal. They have different principles, different ideas. But they're all pure devotees, they're all great devotees. So Srila Prabhupada explains how to please Krishna. Very important for us. We need to know how to please Krishna. Prabhupada says, any language you should submit and you should feel that I am worthless. My Guru Maharaj has given this chance to serve Krishna, to offer Krishna, my Lord, I am worthless. I have no capacity to serve you. Like this very humble, in any language Prabhupada said, we can pray to the Lord. Whether you're speaking Chinese or Hindi or Tamil or Malayali or whatever language you're speaking, doesn't matter. Krishna can understand, but the attitude, the mood is very important that one should think, I am very unqualified, I am worthless, I have no good qualification, I have no capacity to serve you, but on the order of my Guru Maharaj, I am trying to serve you. Please do not take any offence, accept whatever I can do. That's all. That is my request. So like this intense humility, very strongly appealing to the Lord that I, I'm very unqualified. Please overlook my shortcomings and accept me as your servant. So Prabhupada said that mantra is sufficient. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yome Bhaktya Prayachati. Krishna never said that. One who offers me with Sanskrit mantra. Krishna never says you have to use Sanskrit mantra. No. Krishna says, one who offers me with. No. He's, Krishna said, Yome Bhaktya Prayachati. By devotion I will accept. He wants the bhakti, the devotion. He doesn't want the Sanskrit words. He doesn't want the, the scholarly. He wants the devotion. Yome bhaktya prayachati. Real thing is bhakti, feeling. How to serve Krishna. How to please him. That is wanted. Not to see that you are a very good scholar in speaking Sanskrit or English or that is not, that is not important. Always feel that I am worthless, but I have been, by the grace of my Guru Maharaj, I have been given the chance. So kindly accept whatever little service I can give. I am offensive, so kindly excuse me. In this way, be humble, meek, and offer your feeling, and Krishna will be satisfied. From a room conversation in Hyderabad, 1975. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us how we should offer to Krishna that there must be that genuine, genuine humility 
that mood of thinking ourselves unqualified and lowly and we want to offer whatever we possess for the service of the Lord. So this is the, the mood. There must be bhakti, it's devotion that Krishna wants, nothing else, not the offering. When Krishna has many goddesses of fortune in the spiritual world, all serving him. So Krishna is not greedy for our offerings of flowers and fruits. He has better flowers and fruits offered to him in the spiritual world. But he is kindly accepting whatever we offer to him here. Okay, going ahead. Without bhakti, no one can enter the spiritual sky. This is an important qualification, the crucial qualification. Must have devotion. No devotion, no entry. Just like, you know, you go, no mask, no entry. <laughs> you come to the temple, you're supposed to wear a mask, they have a sign up, no mask, no entry. So, you want to go to the spiritual world, no bhakti, no entry. We must have this bhakti and it should be pure bhakti. So all those who maintain self-interest are forced to come back to the material world. And we'll hear, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what position you've got or what qualification you think you have. If you don't have that bhakti, if you don't have that pure devotion for the Lord, you won't get out the material world. You have to come back again. So this is from Prabhupada's purport explaining about the importance of bhakti and about how some great personalities, they cannot enter into the spiritual sky. Even though they may have a very big position, but they cannot enter. Lord Kapila says, My dear mother, someone may worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead with a special self-interest. But even demigods such as Lord Brahma and great sages such as Sanat Kumar and great munis such as Marichi have to come back to the material world again at the time of creation. When the interaction of the three modes of material nature begins, Brahma, who is the creator of this cosmic manifestation and who is full of Vedic knowledge, and the great sages who are the authors of the spiritual path and the yoga system, come back under the influence of the time factor. They are liberated by their non fruitive activities and they attain the first incarnation of the Purusha. But at the time of creation, they come back in exactly the same form and positions as they had previously. So they come back again, although they it said they, are, they were liberated because they were, they were not attached to the results of their work. But that was not enough to get into the spiritual world. Their detachment doesn't take them into the spiritual world, right? Because they still have some self-interest. As mentioned here at the beginning, someone may worship the Lord with a special self-interest. So if we have that self-interest, we still have that self-interest, we may enter into the Mahavishnu at the time of the annihilation. You can enter into the Mahavishnu, but you come back again. It's mentioned here, they are liberated and they attain the first incarnation of the Purusha. The first incarnation means Mahavishnu. 
Mahavishnu is the original Vishnu and from him the creation, the universes are coming out. But at the time of annihilation, everything enters into Mahavishnu. And so, Brahma, the four Kumaras, Marichi, if they have some self-interest, they also enter into Mahavishnu. And then when the creation takes place again, then again they, they come back. They come back into the material world. And they, again they may be Brahma, again they may be the four Kumaras, again they may be Marichi. They didn't get back to Godhead because they still had some self-interest. So our interest has to be simply for the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord Krishna. That is the meaning of bhakti. Anya vilasita samyam jnana karma jana vritam anukuyena krishna no shilanam bhaktir uttamam. Right? That's pure devotion. No desire for fruit of activity or for liberation. One simply wants to please Krishna. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur's commentary on this section of verses. He says, in the Gita, the Lord says, Mam eva ye prapadyante mayami tam tarantite. Right? You know the verse? What's the first part of the verse? Who knows? Mam eva ye prapadyante mayami tam tarantite. What's the first part of the verse? Yes, right. Thank you. Those who said, Krishna saying, this material energy of mine is very difficult to overcome. But those who surrender unto me, they can easily cross beyond it. So those who surrender to me cross over my maya. From this it is understood that even Brahma does not get liberation if he does not have bhakti. So this is Vishwanath Chakravarti speaking on this. What is being described here are Brahma, sages, yogis, jnanis and kumaras who are devoid of bhakti in some particular universe. Because we have Brahmas in every universe, kumaras are also there, these yogis, these people are there in every universe, even shivas are there in every universe. But if they don't have bhakti, then it's a problem. Brahma, sages of all other universes have bhakti and they attain liberation. And prema bhakti with dasya and other relationships according to their degree of bhakti. So different devotees have different levels of bhakti. So some of them are prema bhakta. And they may go, they may get dasya ras, and some may get simply liberation. They have devotion, they get liberation, some level. Some are prema bhaktis, they may be dasya ras, and some may be, uh, as we heard, there's, there's uh, prema para bhaktas, there's prema, uh, prema uttara bhaktas. There's different levels of bhakti, different levels of prem. And the highest, of course, is the very exalted worship of the gopis, the residents of Vrindavan. And their bhakti is beyond everybody's. Because they have Raganuga bhakti. So, very powerful. So, Lord Kapila criticizes the Sakama Karmis. Those people who are attached to results, to enjoying the work. After describing those who are dedicated to nivrita karma in 5 to 7, nivrita karma means what? Nivrita karma? Negation of. What? Karma. What's the meaning, nivrita karma? Renouncing or like, it's opposite of pravriti. Right. And pa pravriti means 
Right. It's, it's like niskam karma yoga. Yeah. Not, not being attached to the results. So that was described in verses 5 to 7. Right? Text in, chapter, in this chapter, five, verses 5 to 7, was describing the detached worker. So Lord Kapila advised to surrender to the Lord in text 21. He told Devahuti to surrender and do devotional service. And after describing those dedicated to pavriti karma, pavriti karma, opposite of nivriti karma, pavriti, there's pavriti and nivriti, right? Pavriti mark and nivriti mark. The, one is the path of enjoyment and one is the path of renunciation. So which is the path of bhakti? Is it pavriti or nivriti mark? Yes, Lord Chaitanya came to teach us Vairagya Vijja Nija Bhakti Yoga. Nivriti, the path of renunciation, is the path recommended for pleasing the Supreme Lord. Pavriti Mark, Pavriti Karma, this is a path of enjoying the material world. Pious, according to the Vedas, according to scriptures. We can enjoy the material world. It's pavriti karma. So after describing those dedicated to pavriti karma, the Lord again advised to just worship the Supreme Lord with devotion. Because the pavriti karmas, they're only a little better than animals. So then 22 to 26, Lord Kapila is concluding his teachings from this chapter. By bhakti, the goals of other paths are also achieved. The jnana and vairagya quickly achieve by practice of bhakti. Bhakti, we just simply have to do bhakti. We don't have to do any other process. Everything will come in bhakti. Knowledge will awaken and vairagya detachment will also come, just simply by practicing bhakti. Because we're practicing bhakti, we have to hear. By hearing, we will cultivate jnana. And by doing service for Krishna, by doing our bhakti, do, doing some devotional service, we'll, we will naturally develop this vairagya. As we hear nicely, we will understand the nature of the material world and we will become detached from it. So jnana and vairagya automatically follow wherever there is real bhakti. So jnana and vairagya quickly come by practice of bhakti. And then 24 and 25 are describing the symptoms of a devotee, devotional qualifications. What are the symptoms of a devotee? Lord Chaitanya was asked to describe how, how to recognize a devotee, right? Asat Sangha Tyag Evaishnavacha Stri Sangha Ekasadu Krishna Bhakti Ar Asat Sangha Tyag The symptom of a devotee, he's not attached to the material. He's given up the material. He's not interested in trying to enjoy this material world. This is a, one symptom of a devotee. And Sri Sangha Ekasadu Krishna, he's not attached to the opposite sex. He's not lusty to try to enjoy or to exploit the other sex. His senses are controlled, he's peaceful. And you could also see symptoms of a devotee are there in earlier the teaching, the qualification of a sadhu, tatikshava karunika suridam sarvadehinam ajata shatrava shantu sadhava sadhu bhushanaha. Sadhu bhushana, the ornaments of the sadhu, tolerant and merciful and uh, 
friendly to all living entities, without enemies, he knows the scriptures, like this, symptoms of a devotee. Then 26, one Bhagavan is perceived differently through different processes. One Supreme Lord is there, but people may follow different processes and they will all realize the Lord through these different processes. The same Lord may be perceived through different ways. Here's a nice verse, Lord Kapila instructing his mother. My dear mother, I therefore advise that you take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for his lotus feet are worth worshipping. Accept this with all devotion and love, for thus you can be situated in transcendental devotional service. So Lord Kapila's conclusion, his mother should simply take shelter of the Supreme Lord, worship the lotus feet, accept this with all devotion and love. So this is Krishna Consciousness, there's nothing more, Lord Kapila's teaching is not different from Bhakti Yoga. And this verse of course is very similar to the verse which comes in the first canto, second chapter, Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Jnana Yati Asu Vairagyam Jnanam Chayata Hai to come. But here, Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Jana Yati Asu Vairagyam Jnanam Yad Brahma Darshanam. <laughs> Same thing is being said, just being said a little differently. Engagement in Krishna consciousness and application of devotional service unto Krishna make it possible to advance in knowledge and detachment as well as in self-realization. So wherever there is bhakti, engagement in Krishna consciousness and the application of devotional service, then it's we will advance in knowledge, jnana and detachment, vairagya, as well as in self-realization, brahmadarshanam. So these things automatically follow wherever there is real bhakti. The chapter continues, text 24. The exalted devotee's mind becomes equipoised of sensory activities and he is transcendental to that which is agreeable and not agreeable. Oh, the devotee's mind is peaceful. The devotee's not considering what's pleasing, what's not pleasing. He's only thinking what Krishna wants him to do. So this is transcendental. The devotee is fixed on the transcendental platform by using everything in the service of Krishna. 25. Because of his transcendental intelligence, the pure devotee is equipoised in his vision and sees himself to be uncontaminated by matter. He does not see anything as superior or inferior, and he feels himself elevated to the transcendental platform of being equal in qualities with the Supreme Person. So you can see that the vision, the consciousness of the devotee, the pure devotee, is not affected by the situation. He sees everything in relation to the Lord. He sees all people equally. Uh, he's, he himself 
elevated to the trans being equal in qualities with the Supreme Lord. Equal in quality. Not in quantity, just quality. He, always a servant. Then 26, the Supreme Personality of Godhead alone is complete transcendental knowledge, but according to the different processes of understanding, he appears differently, either as impersonal Brahman, as Paramatma, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or as the Purusha Avatar. The different processes of understanding, we will perceive the Lord differently. Some people will know the Lord as Brahman, some people know him as Paramatma, the Jnanis will know the Brahman, the Yogis will know the Paramatma, and the devotees will know the Supreme Lord. And the Purusha avatars, who will know that? Those who worship Haranyagarbha. They will know the Purusha avatar. 27 to 36, verses 27 to 36. Summarizing Lord Kapila's teachings on chapters 25 to 29. Attaining Bhagavan realization, the ultimate goal of all Vedic practices. That's the ultimate goal. We want to realize Bhagavan. We're not interested in Paramatma. Okay, so chapter 20 to 24, you heard about Devahudi and Kardama, and we had the appearance of Lord Kapila there. And then we, 25 began Kapila Shiksha, we described Bhakti, Gyan, and then liberation in 27, and 28, Astanga Yoga, 29, we heard Bhakti and how, it's in, uh, how the, part, the, the practitioner of Bhakti can be influenced by the modes of nature. And then we heard about pure bhakti. Then we heard about detachment from matter. It's a common ground for all transcendentalists. So personalists or impersonalists, they're both detached from matter. The impersonalists are very renounced. Devotees also are very careful using how we use the material energy. So detachment from matter it should be, that's the sign of a transcendentalist. One who's actually transcendental, he's not thinking about material sense gratification. The devotee will use matter in the service of Krishna. The impersonalist, they will simply renounce matter. By mental speculation, devoid of devotion, one cannot come to a positive understanding of the Supreme. Mental speculation. Prabhupada gives the example, just like one may hear that the stool of a cow is antiseptic and purifying. So one may think the stool of a brahmana is even more. If, it, if, the, if the cow's stool is antiseptic, the brahmana's stool must be even better. So I'll use the brahmana's stool. So this is speculation. This is the kind of problems which will come up with speculation. We think, because I have a, a body with two arms and two legs, and I suffer old age and disease, so when we see the form of Krishna with two arms and two legs, we think Krishna must also suffer old age and disease. This is speculation. We're thinking, because I'm suffering in my body, Krishna also has a body, he must also be suffering. So this is speculation. We will never understand the Supreme by this kind of speculation. So the process is to hear, to receive the knowledge, comes down directly or indirectly, one should come to the same goal, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
So direct process is bhakti yoga. Indirectly, you may go through the yoga ladder. You begin with karma yoga, and then from karma yoga, you go to jnana yoga, then from jnana yoga, you come to dhyana yoga, and then from dhyana yoga, you know, then you come to bhakti yoga. So that's the indirect process. So we, the word is we just simply bhakti yoga and everything comes. Only by devotion one can understand the absolute truth, just as only by the tongue one can experience the taste of milk. It's a nice example which was given earlier. Devotion. By devotion we can, and Krishna says, Bhaktya Mama Bijanati. Only by devotion can I be understood. So in the same way, the, the, the milk, the taste of milk, can only be understood by the tongue. We cannot understand the taste of milk with the nose. You can smell the milk, you can touch the milk, but you cannot understand the taste. You, only the tongue has the ability to perceive taste. And similarly, to understand the Absolute Truth it has to be by devotion, only by devotion. Okay, text 27. Detachment, okay, we had that, yeah. Detachment from matter, common ground, 28 20 to 30. The Lord is the source of everything. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, everything comes from me. And then text 31. Thus I have explained to you about Gyan, realization of Brahman, by which one understands the truth about Prakriti and Purush. Prakriti, the material nature, there is inferior Prakriti and superior Prakriti, right? Para Prakriti and Apara Prakriti. The material energy is the inferior Prakriti and the living entities, we are also Prakriti. We are the superior Prakriti. Superior because we have consciousness. So we have control over the inferior Prakriti. But above the Prakriti is the Purusha. The Purusha is the Supreme Lord. And of course, those who are imitating the Supreme Lord, they may also think they are Purusha. Ekala Ishwara Krishna or Sabrija. Chaitanya Charitamrita said, there is one Supreme Lord, all others are his servant. So Prakriti and Purush, the relationship between the two. The Prakriti is meant to be used in the service of the Purusha. And the living entities, all of us, we are meant to be used in the service of the Supreme Lord. So this was explained. Here's a little diagram to understand various paths which are utilized to realize the Supreme Lord. We, we can see. Uh, we have yagna. So some people like to do yagya, Kali Yuga Dham, Harinam, Sankirtan. This is a real yagya for the Kali Yuga. So we can also realize the Lord by doing yagya, Harinam, Sankirtan. And then following Varna, doing one's duty, Krishna says in the 18th chapter, Bhagavad Gita, that simply by performing one's duty, one can come to the perfectional stage. And also then ashram, one is a very uh, faithful follower of his, the duties of each ashram. In this way you can also come to perfection. Gyan, by Gyan also we can come to understand Krishna. Bahunam gyanmanamante gyanavam mam prapajyante vasudev sarvamiti samahatma sadulava. The process. After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge, then he surrenders to Krishna. 
So by jnana we can also realize Krishna. And then yoga, yogi nama pisadvesham madgaten antaratmanam. By yoga we may also understand Krishna. Tapas. Tapas, doing austerity to purify our existence. Lord Rishabhdev encouraged his sons to do austerity because that will purify one's existence and then one can experience real pleasure. So tapas in relation to Krishna is encouraged. Tapas in relation to Krishna like doing sankirtan, doing book distribution, trying to distribute books, trying to distribute books to the jagais and madais, to the materialistic demons, it's a great austerity. And then of course we have also tapasyas like chaturmasya, you can do tapasya then. Bhakti, of course bhakti, very powerful to know Krishna, very quickly. And prema, want to get prema, love of God. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give prema to everyone. Krishna prema pradayate, Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gaur Tivish. Lord Chaitanya is distributing freely this prema. So you can get, if you can get prema from Lord Chaitanya, then you can also know Krishna. Then Vedas. Krishna says, by all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I am the author, I am the compiler of the Vedas. So all these different paths are there, they can all lead to Krishna, they can all give us Krishna consciousness. From the second chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, we quote this famous verse, two verses actually. In the revealed scriptures, the ultimate object of knowledge is Krishna, the personality of Godhead. The purpose of performing sacrifice is to please Him. Yoga is for realizing Him. Fruitive activities are ultimately rewarded by Him only. He is supreme knowledge and all severe austerities are performed to know Him. Religion is rendering loving service unto Him. He is the supreme goal of life. Vasudev is the purport of the Vedas. Vasudev is the object of all sacrifices. Yoga, Varnashram, knowledge and austerities are all dependent on Vasudev. Bhakti is dependent on Vasudev. Prem and liberation are dependent on Vasudev. So, Krishna is the Prayojana. Krishna is the goal. And then, this verse we were speaking about before, the multiple perception of God, different ways by which we can perceive the Lord. It says here, a single object is appreciated differently by different senses due to its having different qualities. We give the example, milk has a particular taste, it has a particular smell, has a particular touch, right? Everything, it has its own individual qualities. Similarly, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is one, but according to different scriptural injunctions, He appears to be different. So one God, Ishwara, Ekala Ishwara Krishna, there's one God, but some people know Him as Brahman, some people as Paramatma. Here's the milk, you see? The milk, you can touch it, you can taste it, you can hear, you can see, you can smell it. So what is it? You know, of course you taste it, then we know immediately what it is. It may look like milk, may smell like milk, may, 
different things, the same way people see God in different ways with their material senses. By the eye, milk is perceived to be white. By the tongue, it's perceived as sweet. By touch, it is cool. By the nose, it is perceived as fragrant. By the ear, it is defined as milk. One by one, each perceivable quality is perceived by its particular sense and not by other senses. It is realized as a possessor of a certain quality by that particular sense and not as milk itself, but it is perceived by the king of senses, the mind, as something possessing all the qualities. So in a similar manner, we, we apply this principle to understanding the Supreme Lord. Different senses perceive the Lord in different ways, but the mind can understand all the qualities together. Similarly, one portion of the Lord is perceived by karma. What portion? Swarg. Swarg, heaven, right? One portion of the Lord is perceived by Gyan as the Atman or Brahman. But Bhagavan, the object of Prem, who includes all the other forms and who gives all results, is realized by Bhakti. Here we have the different realizations. On the top, the impersonal Brahman, no form, no personality, just some energy. And then on the right, we have the Lord as Paramatma in his form as he appears in the heart of all living entities. And then we have Bhagavan, the Lord in his original form as a person with his devotees, as a cowherd boy in Vrindavan. This is Bhagavan. So here are some of the different forms of the Lord by how he appears to different devotees. You can see the different Das avatars. Many of the avatars are there. We have Varaha avatar, Matsya avatar, Kurma avatar. We have Lord Kapila Dev, we have Lord Nasringa Dev, we have Dattatreya, we have the Vishwarup, we have Vyasa Dev, we have Lord Rama, and then here's, there's Dhruva Maharaj with uh, Haranyagarbha, and there's Mohini Murti, she also comes, and of course we have Radha and Krishna. So, ma so many different forms the Lord appears in. For the pleasure of his devotees, he appears to give pleasure to all of his different devotees. So different devotees, they each have their particular form of the Lord, which absorbs their mind. Just like Grandfather Bhishma, his absorption was in the form of Lord Krishna as a chariot driver of Arjun, as Partha Sarati. Now Devahuti, her form of the Lord is Lord Kapila. She is absorbed in her son, Lord Kapila. She can only know the, the Lord in that way. So different devotees know the Lord different ways. And here's Radha and Krishna, our worshipable deities here. So then, we have to summarize also time and birth and death, and that's summarized here in verses 37 and 38. Devahuti had asked about that, so it was brought up. My dear mother, I've explained to you the process of devotional service and its identity in four different social divisions. I have explained to you as well how eternal time 
is chasing the living entity, although it is imperceptible to them. Yeah, we don't perceive it, we don't notice the time chasing us, but certainly it's there. We can, it's not so easy to detect it, but it's there. We see, we see how, for example, our hair becomes grey and then drops out, and how the body diminishes, dwindles. All of these are signs of time. So, Lord Kapila explained like this to his mother Devahuti, the importance of devotional service. Text 38, there are varieties of material existence for the living entity according to the work he performs in ignorance or forgetfulness of his real identity. My dear mother, if anyone enters into that forgetfulness, he is unable to understand where his movements will end. So samsara is being described, you can see. If we forget our actual spiritual position, then we will remain in the material world, moving, taking birth and dying again and again. And 8,400,000 different species of life. So we should be very careful not to forget, don't fall into ignorance, don't allow ourselves to be overcome by the illusion. So chapter 30 was describing the mode of ignorance, 31, ignorance and passion, and 32, passion and goodness. What happens if we do not even follow karma yoga? When we don't follow karma yoga, then we, we're simply doing karma. Right? Karma yoga is on the yoga ladder, that's a spiritual activity. But chapter 30, 31, 32, this is de describing karma. Not karma yoga, there's no yoga there, it's just karma. So the mode of ignorance and passion and goodness. And tomorrow we'll hear about Devahuti's bhakti. Then, who is eligible to get these instructions? Verses 39 to 42 describe. Just like the same thing is there in 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna had spoken, then he described who is actually eligible, who can do this. So here, text 39, Lord Kapila continued, This instruction is not meant for the envious, for the agnostics, or for persons who are unclean in their behaviour, nor is it for hypocrites or for persons who are proud of material possessions. We can see some standards are required. Just like in coming to Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada instructed that nobody should stay in the temple, in the Krishna conscious center, unless they strictly follow the four regulative principles and chant 16 rounds. Other people can come to the temple but they cannot stay in the temple, cannot become full-time devotees until they strictly follow four principles and chant 16 rounds. So here, Lord Kapila is describing what is his standard for taking up this path of Sankhya Yoga. We shouldn't be proud, we shouldn't be hypocrites, we should be clean, we shouldn't be envious. And we shouldn't be agnostic, <laughs> Ag agnostics. They believe everything. They think, oh, everything's okay. It's all right. It's all one. Or you know, they're not sure. Not sure what's right. I don't know if it's really right. We should be convinced. You have to be convinced that this is really positive. This is really something we have to commit ourselves to. We have to do it. So that faith has to be there. Then text 40, 
It is not to be instructed to persons who are too greedy and too attached to family life, nor to persons who are non-devotees and who are envious of the devotees or of the personality of Godhead. So if someone's too greedy, then that's, they're greedy for what? Greedy for sense gratification. They're not really qualified for this yoga. And too attached to family life, they're only thinking about their family. They're not think they're thinking materially. They're not thinking on the higher they're not able to come to the higher platform. They're so attached to eating and sleeping, mating and defending. And persons who are not devotees, who are envious, they're envious of Krishna or envious of the devotees. So these qualities are not going to help one to become a devotee. Text 41, instruction should be given to the faithful devotee who is respectful to the spiritual master, non-envious, friendly to all kinds of living entities, and eager to render service with faith and sincerity. So, these kind of people should be encouraged. Faithful devotees, respectful, can be respectful to the authorities, they're not envious, they're friendly people, eager to render service with faith and sincerity. This, this is a good qualification, it's just like for devotional service. We look for this kind of person that they're humble and whatever they're told to do, they will do. Roma Padaswami was telling us, Roma Padaswami is a very senior devotee in the Krishna consciousness movement. Now he's a spiritual master, and he has many disciples. So Roma Padaswami was telling us one time about how he became a devotee, that he'd driven for many, many hours to come to the temple, and finally got to the temple, and it was like the end of the Sunday feast, the Sunday program was just finishing. So he came to the temple and they asked him, they said, Could, would you like to help? We need somebody to do a little help, give us a little help here, could you help? He said, oh sure. So they took him into the kitchen, to the pot room, and there was this huge pile of pots. And they said, could you start cleaning these pots for us? And so he got, he rolled up his sleeves and he went to work. And he just washed all the pots, so many pots, a room full of pots. That was right from the beginning. You know, he'd driven for hours and the, all the prasadam was finished, but still he, he was, he'd come, he was eager to meet the devotees. So they got him to do service and he was washing pots. And he was there for a few weeks washing pots before, you know, they realized more about him and his potential and he was given better engagements. So in the beginning like that, you have to be a little humble. Text 42, this instruction should be imparted by the spiritual master to persons who have taken the Supreme Personality of Godhead to be more dear than anything, who are not envious of anyone, who are perfectly cleansed and who have developed attachment for that which is outside and who have developed detachment from, for that which is outside the purview of Krishna consciousness. So again, some nice qualifications for people who are serious candidates for advancing in Krishna consciousness. They're not interested in the material world. They've, they've come to Krishna consciousness. So they have, they're not, they've detached themselves from all of those things which are not in relation to Krishna. And they take instructions from the spiritual master. They're, they become very attached to Krishna. They've, they've almost like taken shelter of Krishna in the beginning. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has become very dear to them. 
and they don't envy us, they're not envious of people. Like, so these are all very nice qualities. You can see it's the same thing in Krishna consciousness. To actually progress in Krishna consciousness, we, these qualities are so important for us. Being envious of others is not going to help us. Rather, we should appreciate them. We should envy them. Envy them, we want to minimize what we've done. But we can glorify them, appreciate them. That's good. Don't criticize, don't find fault with them, but appreciate what they're doing. Okay, so the final verse, the phala shruti, the fruit of the teachings of Lord Kapila. Anyone who once meditates upon me with faith and affection, who hears and chants about me, surely goes back home, back to Godhead. This is Lord Kapila's benediction. Anyone who meditates upon him with perfection and hears and chants, then you can go back home, back to Godhead. Actually, we have a nice temple coming up at, uh, Lord, at Kapila Muni's ashram. Kapila Muni's ashram is at Ganga Sagar. Ganga Sagar, there's a big mela there every year in the month of Mag, month of January, early January. Millions, many people go there in the month of in January. Devotees are also there. And they do a lot of sankirtan and preaching, book distribution there. So now even Iskon is building a temple there also, at Kapila Muni's ashram. And uh, should be open in a couple of years, I understand. Somebody had donated the cost, the entire cost. So uh, this is Lord Kapila's benediction for us. We have to pray we can also get that kind of devotion for Lord Kapila. Okay, so we'll stop here. This is the end of chapter 32. Are there any questions? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Yes, I accept my humble obeisances. Um, this is, uh, I have a question from text 24, where um, the exalted uh, devotee's mind, or uh, who is transcendental, uh, to the to that which is agreeable and non-agreeable. I couldn't understand this property, Maharaj. And that either in the material world or in the spiritual world, his equipoised mind is completely manifested. So if you could kindly explain the meaning of this. Okay, to that is transcendental to that which is agreeable and non -agree not agreeable. You know, just like in the material world, you know, some things are agreeable to us, you know, I, oh, I, I like this, I'm really happy in this situation and I don't like that, you know. Oh no, don't do that for me, don't give me this, don't do that, we're not agreeable. Some things, you know, like and dislike, so agreeable and disagreeable, not agreeable. Devotees, it's not thinking like that because that's the business of the mind. The business of the mind is thinking what I like and what I don't like, what I want and what I don't want, what I'm agreeable with and what I'm not agreeable. Devotee is transcendentally situated. Is above the modes, because what we are agreeable, what we are agreeable with, and what we like and what we don't like, is all to do with the modes of nature. But on the transcendental platform, we think about Krishna. What is Krishna like? What's for Krishna's service? So this is the point. So, can we apply that like, I want to do this for Krishna and, and if something is there which is not favorable, does this cover also, which is not favorable to Krishna consciousness, I reject? No, oh, definitely, so, yes. Does this cover that also? Yeah, of course, devotees are conscious what's favorable for Krishna and what's not. Devotee, would, he has to have intelligence, be able to discriminate what is good and what is not, what is right, what is wrong. 
I was telling, devotees had a job in the cigarette factory. And Prabhupada said, no, you have to stop that. You cannot work in the cigarette factory. So, and also I have one last question, Maharaj here, in the purport where it is said that um, either, in the material, either in the material world or in the spiritual world, his equipoised mind is completely manifested. So the mind is there even in the spiritual world? That, it, that was one question I had. Well, we have a spiritual mind. Manifested. You have a spiritual mind. You have a spiritual body, so you'll have a spiritual mind. And there's no difference between the body and soul in the spiritual world. No difference between the body and the mind. The mind will also be there, spiritual mind. Yeah? And what does it mean completely manifesting? What? Compl like here it is said that his equipoised mind is completely manifesting. Read the whole Either sentence. in the material or in the spiritual world. Either in the material world or in the spiritual world, his equipoised mind is completely manifested. Okay. So, the equipoised mind is comp means the, that state of the mind being equipoised is there. That it's in, it, whether he's in the material world or the spiritual world, his mind is controlled, peaceful, equipoised, wherever he is, in whatever situation. That is the point. That state of being equipoised, that is manifest. Mm -hmm. One coming to the transcendental consciousness, equipoised mind. Mind must be peaceful. So in the spiritual world or in the material world, mind is controlled. Of course, mind was also will be focused for the service of Krishna. All right, any other questions? Hare Krishna, my Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, just now uh, we mentioned that when we go to heavenly planet, we enjoy our punya, our marines. So can we regenerate punya in a heavenly planet so that we can stay longer? Or you can't regenerate further punya? You just have to enjoy your punya and once depleted, you come down. Yeah, that it seems to be like that. That you, you that you, once you go up to heaven and you enjoy your punya, you, you, I don't, I never heard that you could regenerate your punya in heaven. But of course, some people will go there, and they may be fortunate. They may go up, and they, they can stay there for the life of Brahma. But if their punya runs out, they'll have to come back. So it's a question of. What is their consciousness when they're in the heavenly planets? We know sometimes even in the heavenly planets, Indra has problems that we heard in the sixth canto, you can hear about how he gets sinful reactions. He kills a brahmana, he gets reactions for it. So he can suffer sins. But generally in the heavenly planets, the higher planets, they are doing a lot of punya. They do a lot of rituals, they do yagyas, they offer, chant a lot of prayers and Vedic hymns. If you read Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, it describes about in the higher planets, Tapaloka, there they're, they're sitting doing meditation on the Lord, meditate on the super soul. So you go to these places, they engage in a lot of pious activities. And these pious activities, they help to keep one there. So they can stay, certainly they can they can do some more pious. Generally, that's, that's all they do there in the in the heavenly planets. They're doing pious activities. Janaloka, Tapaloka, uh, Mahaloka, and then Satyaloka. Satyaloka is a planet of Brahma. 
All these four planets up there, they're above, they're above Swarga Loka, above heaven. So they're all doing very pious activities. Smara just now mentioned the earth is karma stan, where we earn karma. So that's why I've been confused that other planets in the system we can't earn a karma. Well, you can, but it generally it, it, it's all done here that, that this is the real place where people get the karma and where you can, it's from here you can also go directly back to Godhead. So the demigods, they can't go back to Godhead from the higher planets, but from earth you can go back to Godhead. There's some, some special facilities about this planet which allow it that you can go directly back to Godhead. But other places you've got to wait for the end of the life of Brahma. The, the people on the higher planets, they, when there's a partial annihilation, they'll go up to Brahma Loka, they'll gradually move to higher and higher planets, wait, waiting for the end of the life of Brahma. And then at the end of life of Brahma, then they go back to Godhead. So karma, definitely, the karma, the main focus on karma is here on this planet. It's going to determine whether you go up or you go down or you come back. That's how it's described. Thirteenth chapter of Bhagavad Gita talks about this place being a place of karma, the karma stand. But you do something wrong, you, you go to heavenly planets, you do sinful activities, certainly you get suffer, you suffer. You know, Nahusa became Indra at one point. Indra had gone away and this person, Nahusa, became king of heaven. But Nahusa became lusty after Indra's wife. So the res result was he became a snake. He was cursed to become a snake. And so karma is there, even in the higher planets, you know, certainly if the brahmanas curse you, you suffer. Indra, because his guru, he didn't respect his guru, he suffered and the demigods were able to defeat. The demigods were defeated by the demons because Indra had offended his guru. So they'd lost the blessings of their guru, so they couldn't, they couldn't defeat the demons. You could say this is karma, this was their reactions. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. So, uh, it is said that in, uh, when we go to Brahmaloka, then uh, those are worshippers of the Hirne Garbha, Bodhaka Shaya Vishnu. They get liberated only after the destruction of uh, Brahmaloka. Yes. But uh, in Bhagavatam, second canto, second chapter 27th verse, in the, they said that in the plant of Satyavaka, there is neither bereavement nor old age nor death. There is no pain of any kind and therefore there are no anxieties saved at times due to consciousness. There is a feeling of compassion for those who are unaware of God's solutions. It says that everyone is a devotee there. They are compassionate, those who are not uh, engaged in devotion service. There is no old age death, neither man, none of the material miseries are experienced over uh, Satyaloka. But uh, here, in this chapter, third canto, 32nd chapter, we are saying that uh, they also have such. They get liberated after uh, after Brahma's Brahmaloka is destructed, and also they also take birth again. Yes. So, Bhagavad Gita also says a Brahma Bhuvana Loka Puneravartanu Arjuna. From the highest planet down to the lowest, all are places of birth and death. Right. So, such a Loka. That's Brahma Loka. You're describing such a Loka. You said. There's no old age, there's no death. But they're not back to Godhead yet. They're still in the material world. So they have to, they have to wait for the, their body. They, they don't have the gross body. Their bodies are very subtle 
on the higher planets there. So they don't suffer like what we suffer on the earth planet. We suffer, you know, so many things, the, the disease, the, certainly there's no disease on the higher planets. Old age, old, they don't have, have the old age the way, they don't have the invalidity like what we have. It's not there in the higher planets. But there are people who have been there a long time. So the impressions are not so great. And there's a feeling of compassion. But they're not doing anything about it. So they're waiting, they have to wait for the end of the universe, for that total annihilation. Then at that time, if they have no self-interest, then they can go into the spiritual world. It's also said that Brahma and Maharaj, four Kumaras, all they take birth uh, during the creation again, because they have some self-interest. Seems that Brahma is on the level of Mahatma. Four Kumaras are also pure devotees, and they have met the Lord and they became devotees. Well, remember what it says, it, it is saying, if Brahma has self-interest, so in different universes, different places, it will be different. Some Brahmas will be pure devotees, some will not. Right? Brahma is a position. And, and, and the, it seems also like Marichi and the four Kumaras, these also seem to be like positions. So it's going to be different for different universes. The, the, the criterion is if they have self-interest. So it's saying it's possible that if they're not pure devotees, they have to, they'll come back again. Yeah? Okay. Maharaj, is it that uh, Brahma is already, since he has taken from the uh, birth of uh, Garbhadat Nashaya Vishnu and uh, he is already a Mahaja, naturally all Brahmas are like that from you, Maharaj. So all are pure devotees. Am I right, Maharaj? No. No? No. They're not all pure devotees. We're, we had the Brahma in this universe this time that he was a pure devotee because he shook hands with the Lord. He came and it's described in the Srimad Bhagavatam how after doing his austerity and everything then he realized the truth and then he became completely pure and the Lord was so pleased with them he came and shook hands with him. So in this universe, this life Brahma is pure. But not in every, there's many, many universes. And there's many Brahmas. But not every Brahma is a pure devotee. Is it that, Maharaj, once all the jivas who are here also were once Brahma, then again gradual fall down has happened? Could you say that again? Means the jivas who are here. They have uh, glided down from the position of Brahma to the end. Well, it, apparently it does say that somewhere, that previously we had the position of Lord Brahma, that that's where that when the living entity falls into the material world, he's given a big position, he, en he doesn't enter. When you come into the material world, you don't enter in the lower species, you come in the higher species, you enter in the on the higher planets and you may even get the position of Lord Brahma or a resident in Satyaloka. You may be on the planet of Brahma, you may be there with him. So that's when you first come into the material world. Yes. But then we fall down you know, and we come in and we, 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 we become more self-conscious, more self-interested. And we remain in the material world and we gradually we drop down and down to the lower species, lower levels. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Then our last question, Maharaj. Actually, this uh, Dharmartha Kama Moksha, that Moksha, that's a normal course of uh, religious process. So here, Dar, uh, by doing Dharma, one can get Artha and Kama and the psyche continues. They repeatedly do that. 
just like chewing it chewed but uh, the the natural uh, phenomenon is when you do perform dharma you get artha and kama but uh, you uh, when the kama is satis- dissatisfied one get one, one is interested in moksha destroy so how it seems that uh, they don't get dissatisfied how do they do the same thing chewed against chewed How how what, how do they do chewing the chewed? How does when, it? Yeah yeah. When the mo- when the karma is dissatisfied, they seek for moksha. Uh huh. So that's uh, that is also happening by the will of the Lord. Yes. By so they didn't uh, mention and even such moksha is also that uh, frustration of arising from the dissatisfaction of the karma is also that that the type of moksha they also achieve is of impersonal. Uh, liberation only so the point here the question is that they don't get the moksha only they they just uh, the cycle rotates like dharma artha and kama it rotates 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 so mm. how is it that it can go without dissatisfaction well gen- generally people are only interested in kama artha and kama and so they get sense gratification and they're always thinking, well, I didn't get enough sense gratification, I want more sense gratification. So they try again more and more. So that's where it becomes chewing the chewed. They're, you know, they're trying to enjoy, trying to take pleasure from the material world. And they've already tried so many times before in so many different species of life, but they're thinking, no, I didn't make it last time, but this time I'll make it, this time I will enjoy. This time I'll be happy. And so this way it becomes chewing the chewed, trying to take pleasure from where there's no, really no pleasure. So this is the, 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 when it talks about chewing the chewed, that's what's implied there. The, then how does the dissatisfaction come and seeks for the moksha? Well, they have to be tr- really frustrated in their attempts, and they have, to, they have to be philosophically inclined. Be, they have to be willing to give up the attempts, the endeavors for sense gratification. So we, we see it's not very common that people actually become, that people take an interest in moksha. Some few people, not very common. Most people only interested in sense gratification. How, very rarely do people come to moksha and think about moksha. How do they do it? The ones who come to moksha, they have to have a, a, some awakening, some philosophical inclination to hear and to understand the nature of transcendence. So some guidance should come. Uh, it's explained that we may go, we may go to the temple and we may do karmakandi activities. So you have a priest guide you, and the priest guides you how to do the karmakandi activities, and this way you develop faith in the priest, and you trust also the scriptures, that you're following scriptures, and you may get good results for some time. And, but then we may realize that the results of our karmakandi activities are temporary, that we're not getting any real eternal, eternal happiness. So the person who is a little intelligent will ask, what do I need to do to get eternal benefit? Where can I get the eternal gain from it? Because this is also temporary. Either, either in this world or going to higher planets, I can go to higher planets, but I can't stay there, I have to come back. So what can I, how can I get eternal benefit? And so then they may be directed to the liberation, that you have to go for liberation. You have to think of the higher goal, the, come to transcendence, understand the Bra- Brahman, what is beyond the material is the Brahman. And so the, they have faith in the priest and they have faith in the scriptures, and so they may read the scriptures and they hear about the Brahman, where they can get something which is eternal, and they may endeavor for that. But it's not common. Most people 
They don't care about having the eternal. They're happy with the temporary. Just let me have the temporary pleasures here. Why I should work so hard, have to give up everything material to get the spiritual? Why I should do that? They're not willing to do that. So this is a problem, trying to bring people to a higher consciousness, to get them even to take an interest in transcendence is not easy. And so it says, Manushya nam sahasri siddhi Out of thousands of men who are endeavouring, hardly one becomes perfect. M most people are just karmis. A few people are pious, religious men. They will do karmakandi activities, follow scriptures. And then people who are more pious, they think about the Brahman, the impersonal liberation. But is there any instances, Maharaj, uh, that uh, those who went to the Brahma Jyotis have fallen down? Oh, any particular examples? Yeah, the, the, of, that the, the, the scriptures say that you go to the Brahman, you're not going to stay there. You're going to come back. Right? Arora krichrena param patam tata patanti ado nidreta yasmadangraya. That because their intelligence is not purified fully, so they have to come back to the material world. And we see big yogis and sannyasis who renounce the world, that they come back and they will do welfare activities. They will take up some welfare work, they will open the, the, the school, or they will open a hospital, or they will do some kind of a children's home, something like this. Welfare work. They will take up this welfare work because they could not satisfy themselves on the transcendental platform. They had renounced the world. They'd gone off to live in the mountains, in the Himalayas. They were living in the... but then they come back. And then they come back and they want to open the school, they want to open the mission in the, in the material world and do welfare activities. These are the examples of the yogis, the, the Brahman, the, the, they'd come to the platform of Brahman, but they come back again to take up material activities. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we have examples of those who were self-realized, who had realized Brahman, who went on to become devotees. We have Sukadeva Goswami and we have the four Kumaras. They were Brahmagyanis, but they became devotees. So that, these examples are there to show the power of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. But we don't see any devotees becoming impersonalists. We don't see any people who practice bhakti taking to the impersonal Brahman. Because there's no pleasure there. There's no, there's no real rasa there, no taste on the Brahman. Simply it becomes boring, simply the oneness. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Anvad Pranam. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, can you please elaborate on what kind of people reach the Paramatma destination, the Hiranyagarbha destination, or those people who worship the Lord Narayan as the Lord of Vaikuntha? So like all this, it's basically the 400 Narayan form only. So if you can please elaborate a little bit on that part. Yes, well. People who worship the Narayan form, we see the, the Sri Vaishnavas, they generally worship the Narayan form. Right? The Ramanuja Sampradaya, Ramanuja Vaishnavas, they worship the Lord as Narayan. They consider Lord Narayan to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead and Lord Krishna to be his avatar. So they worship the Lord. That's, 
Narayan, they worship with, in the mood of Aishwarya, with opulence and great reverence and like that. And people who worship uh, Haranyagarbha, that's, well, some people, they, they will worship, that's Lord Vishnu also, so that's, that could be also there. They could be devotees. What, who else did you ask about? People who worship? The Paramatma. Paramatma. So the Astanga Yogi is meditating on the Paramatma. The, the people doing Astanga Yogi, they, med, they meditate on the Paramatma. And the Paramatma, meditating on the Paramatma, you see some people, they will realize the Lord. Some people will think they are the Lord. They think they've become God. Some people, they're worshipping the Paramatma, they want to get yoga powers, they want to get yoga cities. So that's material. Some people, they think they've become God, they cannot distinguish between the Lord and the living entity, and so they become impersonalists, they think they're God. And other people, they will understand the Lord and the living entity, that they're eternally different and that their relationship is servant and they will become the servant. So there are different, it will depend on what kind of yogi he is, who's different. We see the different moods are there with the Astanga Yoga. The real purpose of the Astanga Yoga is to become the servant of the Lord. But not every Astanga yogi comes to that conclusion. Some, they just want the yoga powers, they want the yoga cities. Some, and, and they use the yoga cities to attract followers. Right. Astanga, you, yeah, is it clear? Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so we'll finish then, and we will meet again tomorrow, it will be the last class. So chapter number 33, that's the end of the Kapila Sheik, end of the section, end of third canto. Okay, thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.